Good evening, everyone. On behalf of the Indian Express Group, a very warm welcome to the Indian Express Think Series on Gender presented by IWWAGE. I Think is a thought provoking forum that brings together thought leaders, policy makers, and corporate leaders to encourage a substantive exchange of ideas and get the best minds to give it direction and solutions. Uh, today, we focus on gender responsive economic recovery and bouncing back better. With more women than men having lost their jobs during the pandemic, it is necessary to look at policies that encourage them back into the workforce and help reintegrate them into the mainstream. Questions about skilling, incentivizing women-led businesses, access to funds, protection of rights, establishing pay parity, all these become important in this context. Um, the session will have a special keynote address followed by a panel discussion. Uh, first, please join me in welcoming our guests. Our keynote speaker is Minister of State for Electronics and Information Technology and Skill Development and Entrepreneurship, Rajiv Chandrasekhar. And our panelists for today are Manish Sabarwal, Vice Chairman, Team Lease, Renana Jabwala, Chair, Seva Bharat, Avni Kapoor, Fellow, Center for Policy Research and Lead Accountability Initiative, the session will be moderated by Archer Magazine of the Indian Express. I request everyone to remain connected throughout the session on social media um, by using the hashtag uh, gender in India. Um, may I now request Archer to please share the introductory note with us. Hello, everyone. Um, female labor force participation has been low historically. And of course, with the last two years, the COVID shock coming in, this trend has become worse. So women, they tend to earn less, they have fewer savings, they have less access to social security. This trend has now become even worse. What we are going to look at are possible solutions for uh, the marginalization of women, especially at the bottom of the pyramid, how they are faring, how they can be brought back into mainstream. The two years of pandemic have not uh, been... Um, Justify, have not justified the work that women have put in, especially with the unpaid work, uh, especially with the care uh, they provide in households, which uh, increased due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, uh, there is also a factor of the COVID worsening the poverty gap. You know, the gender, in view, uh, gender ratio is reflective in that fear also. We are not only seeing it in employment terms, but also in poverty terms and how women are bearing a greater brunt of the pandemic. Um, I would now uh, request the minister to make his keynote address. Thank you. So, um, the women have lost jobs more than men after the impact of uh, COVID-19 pandemic. It's been two years. And now a lot of um, impact is being seen, especially in the services sector. Um, women have been burdened with unpaid work. Uh, they are sharing um, a more work in terms of care. And that impacts their, um, that is reflective of the unpaid work, which is where the women had actually made a transition from in the previous years. So the hit from the pandemic has actually uh, again shifted them to the margin. Uh, so this is the theme that we are focusing on in this session. And uh, I, um, I request you to make your address. Sir. Thank you, Anshal. Thank you, Dean Express, for uh, inviting me to speak uh, today. Um, you know, as we speak, uh, we are um, we are in interestingly at two very important milestones, if, if I may use that. One is, of course, as a nation, we are uh, lo looking back at the 75 years that we have uh, traversed as an independent nation. And uh, it is an opportunity for us to look back and see how far we have progressed or, or in some cases, how little we have progressed. And uh, we look to the future as well. Uh, there is a new, whole new generation that is looking at the future with very different set of expectations and aspirations, men and women are both included. So there is there is that that is uh, in the backdrop of conversations like this. 
and there is this other important uh, milestone that we are in a sense getting out of or we are just uh, we are just progressing out of which is the covid this uh, historically most disruptive black swan event that has uh, been thrust on the world uh, and the people of the world causing issues of health uh, lives livelihoods uh, economic impact uh, lives impact on lives which is the covid pandemic and india is uh, in a sense all of us are uh, you know stepping out of these two very important events as a backdrop as we look to the future and as we look into the coming years and to shape uh, our future for the coming years and i think in that context to talk about uh, you know how far the women of india have come how far what has been uh, the state of the women's participation during the covid uh, pandemic and what will be the way forward is an important conversation to have as we are having conversations uh, across the country uh, in this backdrop for the economy for health uh, and many other many other topics but this is an important element because it addresses uh, the women of india who have for many years and if you just look back at the last 75 years had a less than stellar fair deal in the last 75 years and have constantly had to f- struggle uh, not just in the marketplace of opportunities but uh, with a stacked deck against them on societal values traditions uh, you know the, the these decades and centuries old traditions that were all designed in a sense to hold women back from participating uh, with women in in the opportunities uh, that are presenting themselves whether they are in the workforce whether they are in in other areas as well so i think it is in that context that we are having this discussion but i want to say two two three broad points before i launch into uh, my own take on what the future is going to be like one is clear that in the last 6 to 7 years specifically uh, and i'm not saying that this is not true for the years before there has been a dramatic uh, change in the expansion in the opportunities that have been uh, afforded to women or that have been that have presented themselves to the women of india so if you look across the spectrum whether it is business whether it is the armed forces whether it is uh, you know participation in government judiciary the institutions that were male dominated male bastions in the past i think there is hardly a glass ceiling that hasn't been shattered in the years preceding covid and then and you know i have data and facts to prove it as uh, the year 17 2017 18 18 19 Uh, uh participation of women in the workforce both formal and informal grew uh, unemployment in the country pre covid had reached 4.8% unemployment which means employment was growing uh, over 5 crore uh, uh, new jobs were created uh, between 19, 1819 and 1920 so all of these were creating a tailwind there was there was a political leadership there was a political Uh, uh, intent to create equal opportunity and a level playing field for both genders in this country and that train was moving ahead with some momentum with you know with clearly leadership backing then we had covid and covid clearly uh, uh, and any which way you look at it a it was global it had deep impact on uh, deep economic impact on supply chains uh, industry workforce employment labor uh, as well as what we already know that it had impact on lives and health and uh, all of the other things that we have we've read and heard and experienced so much but in that i think you know you, there is really no published data in the sense that we can quote to the decimal point on the numbers on uh, what has been the impact on the male uh, uh, workforce versus the female workforce both formal and informal but there is in- enough empirical evidence that women took uh, the brunt of the shock uh, if you want to call it that and i use the word shock because the pain difficulty shock uh, disruption whichever way you want to phrase that it is clear that women took uh, a larger portion 
of that uh, the brunt of the shock and impact of the covid pandemic uh, whether it was their role as roles as homemakers or the roles as professionals or in, in in roles in 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 industries like hospitality and service industries which uh, were uh, we took the brunt of this across the world by the way this is not something unique to india it is clear that the women workforce and the women participants in the workforce uh, did take a, a bigger hit and uh, we are, we are where we are today the uh, i can speak for the indian economy uh, because of the policies uh, enacted the very calibrated policies of economic policies we have managed to soft land the economy in the first quarter of uh, 2020 2021 despite the lockdown despite the global disruptions and you can see today we are the largest uh, fastest growing economy in the world uh, we have received the highest fdi we have record agricultural exports record exports so we we can safely say that the worst is behind us in terms of workforce disruptions and economic disruptions and we are now uh, down the runway there where india has shown the resilience and, uh, uh, and uh, in a sense the strength to come back on the stronger than almost any major economy in the world so this is a good time to look at what is the way forward to ensure that the women participation in our workforce is in a sense much more uh, resistant or resilient to any shocks like this both economic or pandemic if they uh, god forbid if it happens in the past now you can assume that we we, we will all pray and hope that there are no pandemics uh, in the near term but we can look at upturns and downturns in economic cycles that are normal to, for global economic uh, uh, you know in in global economics and so how do we prepare our workforce how do we prepare our policies and outlook to make sure that women don't take a disproportionate hit if there is such a thing in the past and how do we make the women's participation in our workforce much more resilient and much more uh, uh, much more stable and predictable um, as is the case with the, the male uh, workforce and to that end um, i would argue and uh, you know this is like i said this is all now we are all talking about personal opinions and views and and, and postulations and hypotheses that one of the key things that is helping drive an inc uh, rapidly uh, accelerating women's participation is the increased digitization of our uh, world with many many more opportunities in the digital space there's many more opportunities today for remote working than were there pre covid the technology infrastructure economic models are lending themselves to more and more having women participate uh, into these uh, businesses rather than the conventional pre covid or even you know 10 years ago model of um, of uh, the employment and labor, labor and workforce participation so i would argue that the 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 in the post covid reality the economic models and the workforce models and labor participation models afford more opportunities for women uh, uh, and uh, and remote working for women number 1 number 2 like i said digital the fact that digital technologies are now going driving almost every business every government every enterprise and in increasing consumer uh, consumer digitization of consumers uh digital tech, uh, the tech space which traditionally has always had a higher participation of women and i think yesterday nascom has just put out a number that says there are over 5 crore uh, totally in the technology workforce in, in india and over 36% is our women which is of the highest uh, highest participating uh, highest women participating sector in the country today so if if sectors like digital and sectors like electronics are the growth sectors in of the future and women's participation in there are, is very high and the new post covid model allows women uh, uh, to overcome the other barriers that existed pre covid to enter these workforces i think there is an alignment of uh, both opportunity and the uh, the the cause the 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 the, uh, the other factors that drive these opportunities so i think that is one on the other hand one of the things that we are focused on in the government apart from encouraging these opportunities and encouraging women participation in these new emerging areas 
is effectively to allow a bit to direct our skilling and skill programs and the new education policy programs also to ensure more and more women participate in in hitherto uh, untapped areas for women and i'll give you an uh, example that i love quoting to people who talk about changing india the plumbing sector is traditionally a sector that is uh, seen by most including you until I, i would argue as uh, dominated by men uh, you know you think of people who go get skilled as plumbers to be men who will become plumbers or, or work for uh, one of these companies that employ plumbers and plumbing contracts and so on and so forth but increasingly we are seeing many women wanting to take plumbing courses not because they want to become plumbers but they want to become plumbing sales executives or plumbing uh, you know uh, product managers so there is all of this uh, uh, these ambitions and aspirations and hitherto unknown opportunities new which are really new opportunities that are being created because we are offering skills to uh, to the uh, the when men and women equally and it is for them to use those skills to create opportunities uh, for themselves either in employment or micro entrepreneurship so i will uh, summarize uh, this in 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 this way that in a lot of ways what the prime minister's vision was in 2014 when he became prime minister to about empowering women and making sure that they have the confidence and the 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 government's policy backings to participate in every opportunity as as much as possible that is available in india post covid i think there is more impetus to it and there is a tremendous more focus in delivering the skills and creating the ecosystem that allows them to um, to to grow and prosper in the post covid opportunity space there is absolutely no doubt in my mind even though i don't have data to share with you or you don't have data to share with me that women of india have taken an extraordinary amount of the 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 brunt of um, the covid and have also played interestingly uh, and this needs to be said as health warriors and as uh, uh, as you know significant stakeholders in the healthcare sector have also played a huge role in the resilience that india has shown during the covid in terms of the vaccine delivery uh, uh, etc so i think uh, all in all it has been uh, it has been a tremendous journey in the last two years where we have suffered tremendously but out of which i think we are emerging almost like a, a phoenix uh, out of uh, post covid as a country that is very confident and very 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 confident about reimagining its future and uh, in that in that uh, reimagine future with a stronger role and a stronger set of opportunities and a expanded set of opportunities for uh, employment and micro entrepreneurship for the women of india so i will i will stop at that and uh, i would be happy to take uh, any questions Uh, that your audience has thank you so much uh, jain thank you sir a very insightful in fact the uh, bit about women uh, looking for plumbing jobs that was very insightful but what i am trying to understand is um, you know a lot of these opportunities for aspirations for women actually exist in the urban areas and how do you actually reach out in the government towards rural women who have been actually who have lost out much more in this pandemic phase than the urban areas no it's a, it's a good question and i just want to I, i just want to share two data points with you one is that during the covid uh, two years of covid it is the rural economy that actually was supercharged and kept kept going on without uh, much of a hiccup uh, you know the you can see from the agricultural production numbers you can see from the rural uh, from your uh, you know fmcg companies how they talk about the rural economy that was uh, kept strong during covid so i think uh, the rural economy was not and and, and that is in my in, in, in uh, i would argue in a lot of ways that shows you what a change india we are living in because usually at the time of a pandemic or a drought or a flood it is usually the rural sector and you know our the villages and people living in rural india that are much more vulnerable that is a conventional wisdom of the last 70 years or 75 years of independence and actually the converse happened during the pandemic 
it is a rural economy that showed tremendous progress in strength and actually rural employment went up rural production and productivity went up and the rural economy grew but having said that i think you are asking this context in the context of women and i i say this that it is clear without necessarily attributing economic parameters or variables to it it is a safe assumption to make that the women of india took the the most of the hit in terms of emotional economic whatever you want to call it during the covid and that is just something that we all agree with it is not there's nothing to argue about that but in that context i must tell you that we have a very significant skill development network called the jan shikshan santan which is aimed really at skilling women and rural women and community women women who are far off from cities and uh, panchayat headquarters and that jan shikshan santan did very well i visited many of them during the covid and uh, you know it, it is amazing the stories of resilience that uh, that are there in the real world we sit in delhi and we 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 you know we we live with some certain assumption but the jan shikshan sansthan in kerala that i visited in the in uh, in the northeast that i visited women had reinvented themselves and when the the classroom programs had been shut because of covid they took to youtube and there were people thriving during covid make baking cakes um and uh, and running a small business around their neighborhood and uh, i i, I frankly uh, met a lady who just left such an impression on me who said i knew how to make two cakes from the jss before the covid struck and now i know about 11 different types of it because i use youtube and some other distance learning tools and i can't speak what those cakes are because they are very french and foreign sounding but uh, i i make you know 40 cakes a day and i sell it in my community and that is really the micro economy of our country and that is what atmanirbhar bharat really is about it's about local economy micro local economy and micro entrepreneurship entrepreneurship that serves the economy and to the question they asked these uh, ladies uh, for example i visited one in cochin and outside of cochin and they i said how do you market and they were savvy they were using instagram they were using facebook all of those digital tools that took primacy during covid they had used that and they were uh, running these businesses so i think the the enterprise amongst women of india are equal to if not more than the enterprise uh, of men uh, i think covid has in a, in number of ways exposed them to more challenges and also you know i would argue strongly that they have responded to those challenges and discovered newer and newer ways of doing things as far as the government is concerned our role will always be that of an enabler and that enabling role for example the jss's role i am so impressed by during covid that we have taken a decision in government to double the number of jss in the country in the next two years and jss are only for women almost 90% of those who are skilled via the jss are women only so i i think that shows that that is in a sense talking to your question about what is it that we plan to do we are planning to double for uh, women of our rural communities uh, the number of jss that are available for them to be skilled and their skilling ranges from digital skilling to financial skilling to being you know to workforce skilling like and micro entrepreneurship skilling so uh, that that whole sort of expanse of opportunities we will keep increasing it as we see more and more innovative ways that the community wants and the local community wants in terms of skills and trades that they want so like you mentioned a lot of uh, uh, tools they are using digitally uh, digital tools are being used for growing their business so how do you see uh, in the future also government how where can government intervene in terms of those digital tools to help the rural women especially to get access to safe funding uh, for their projects businesses or so so i think that when we say entrepreneurship in in my in our ministry and in our government we want to uh, ob- the entrepreneurship in this new post covid age will clearly regardless of whether you are you are you are in the flower business or you are in the uh, 
bakery business or you are doing some other products or services will require digital skills you need to be online you need to be on uh, on the net so digital skills and the prime minister had launched a program three years ago and that is in my opinion a sign of the foresightedness of our government that called pm disha which is which is really about uh, uh, skilling rural women predominantly in digital skills so that they could do digital banking they could do the jdy account management on their own they could uh, and you know many of the beneficiaries the money that is being sent by the government is being sent in in the the women of the households name so that kind of digital literacy programming that had started 3 years ago 4 years ago rather will continue to pick pace now i think the skilling that we are wanting to deliver to women and men equal uh, is about how do you use digital platforms to drive your micro entrepreneurship how do you do you use a digital platform to drive your entrepreneurship how do you use digital platforms for skilling and learning and how do you uh, in a sense grow and uh, prosper based on this new covid uh, uh, digital world in addition you you also heard the ministry of finances many many initiatives of bringing credit online getting micro enterprises and msme uh, credit delivery online and digitally so there is a digital platform that is being envisaged by the skill india uh, ministry of skill development uh, and the uh, uh, the honorable finance minister mentioned it in the budget it's called desh the desh stack part of that desh stack will include the ability for micro entrepreneurs to come online work on these opportunities skill themselves and also seek out finances so it is it is an ecosystem of credit skills and opportunities uh, that will be all put together on a digital platform be made available for those who want skills for employment or skills for micro entrepreneurship in the pre pandemic year uh, we had data from periodic labor force survey showing an increase in the uh, share of women for unpaid work in household enterprises it went up to 42% so um, you know that now we don't have the latest empirical data on it of course but how can that portion be addressed because what we saw was a reversal of trend you know unpaid work going up agriculture share going up so those those sectors also need to be addressed because uh, for women employment especially it tends to happen that the nature of employment becomes casual in many ways they how to bring them into organized workforce look this is a this is a 75 year old challenge for india where uh, a large percentage of our workforce is informal and uh, there are, uh, and this this government that has made attempts at really trying to formalize it and the reason for formalizing is not just from a point of view of labor force accounting it is to make sure that uh, whether it's men or women whether they are urban or rural whether they are from the north south east or west uh, uh, every participant in the workforce must be uh, uh, should be entitled to his or her rights uh, and so therefore that process of formalization is an important for, uh, process and if you see over the last 5 years the formalization of our workforce has slowly and steadily increased my my answer and i speak as not as an expert on on workforce i am not a labor minister i you know i uh, my 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 mandate and my passion is to um, empower as many indians as possible uh, uh, with the vision of prime minister which is to skill them and empower them with the skills so that they can get ahead so i i am not a scientist on the labor force movement but i can say this that at the end of the day formalizing is the best answer to ensuring that workforce participants get their rights their due rights and and that we protect them from exploitation uh, and uh, a lot of what you are saying is a case of partly a case of not understanding your rights as a as an as an individual or a case of societal subjugation as unfortunately we see even today Uh, where people are you know selling uh, ideas either in the name of religion or caste uh, to just to keep a particular uh, uh, group of women down so it's either that or it is like i said 
it is the, the it's a case of exploitation which is where you have labor contractors and all of these uh, elements that are uh, in a sense unregulated uh, and therefore they exploit we need to progress this we need to grow the skill people educate people and basically an educated empowered uh, citizenship uh, and uh, educated empowered skilled workforce uh, will no longer allow themselves to be unpaid uh, labor for some exploitative force and i think that's the only answer i can give like i said I, i'm not a pundit on the subject but i believe strongly in empowerment and i believe that skilling and education is the best way to empower uh, a man or a woman right sir uh, so just last question probably um which sectors are you essentially your ministry looking at uh, to focus for reskilling upskilling uh and of course both male and women uh, workforce but especially for women where do you see uh, you all ministry will be focusing one of the, one of the things until i am very very clear on particular about and it is you know follows from our honorable prime minister's uh, broad view is that it is not government's place to decide what uh, a or b or c should study or should learn and and direct them or point them in any one direction we have today in the skill ecosystem over 4500 courses and trades that are being taught i would like i have given my ministry a target that that should be 10000 uh, and that should become 15000 because it is as long as the ecosystem provides more and more innovative trades more and more innovative skills of the future it is for and we and we create visibility and aspirations around those skills we create opportunities around those skills it is for a young indian to decide uh, what is his or her uh, you know what, what is he or she excited by some people may be excited by arts as a vocational training some people may be music some people may be wanting to dedicate their lives to sports some people may be coders in the future of the it industry some people could be something else so it is not i don't want to be today some uh, some visionary uh, crystal ball gazer and say i now say please go and train yourself in this but yes i would say this as i say to my children i say to my friends children and i meet any young person the digital skills uh, regardless of whether you are going to create a career in agriculture or you are going to become a carpentry uh, a micro entrepreneur A anything that you do today going forward you need digital skills so i think sort of reinforcing yourself with digital skills is almost like a prerequisite uh, when we grew up for us the alphabets and mathematical multiplication tables these were all the prerequisites i think to the alphabets and the uh, multiplication tables you need to also have digital skills added to almost every uh, young child and the new education policy and i and i just want to say this for your viewers is one of the biggest reforms in education that has been enacted in independent india and it does something very fundamentally different for our children and for their future from the 6th standard onwards now every child can be exposed or, and choose some vocational skill that he or she wants so from the 6th to the 12th before he or she enters the higher education ladder they have 5 to 6 years to figure out apart from science and social studies and history and geography and english and hindi and the languages that the mother tongues what other subjects are they, they do they have the propensity for do they have the uh, talent for and that could be electronics it could be mechanical it could be art it could be whatever so that gives them additional opportunities after they graduate from school to to uh, to pursue career choices and to pursue life choices so i think they are living in very interesting times uh, there is this new education policy there is this really uh, tremendous amount of awareness and demand for skills amongst the youth and uh, we are now coming out of a period of covid where india is and indians are really confident about the future and want really to learn more do more and excel more so i think we are a very interesting intersection uh, the government uh, role as i said and i know you were yours was a pointed question we will remain 
very very actively uh, engaged as enablers and creators of this ecosystem of opportunity and skills and uh, and allow our children to succeed and hopefully drive the next generation of innovation and creativity for the world right sir i hope the future is as bright as you are painting it to be thanks a lot for john we must make it as bright anchal I, i i know there is a lot of skepticism and cynicism that's inbuilt into delhi i uh, I like to believe I'm not from Delhi, and therefore I always look at everything with a lot of optimism. And I think these last two years, and sorry to take up the last two minutes of your time, the last two years have proved, in the face of what in rampant cynicism, of the kind that we saw from all across the world and in, in, including India, we have proved that optimism, collective resilience, and collective prayers. can change the narrative how the narrative how our uh, uh, intellectual uh, the narrative is from who, whichever source so we have to believe in this opportunity because this is a real opportunity and i i i am personally very very optimistic about the future especially for our younger generations i mean we are almost done with where uh, what uh, you know what the journey that we have traveled but for the coming generations i think the opportunities are just tremendous and the world of you know pro- prosperity uh, and i am sorry to sound very metaphorical but i genuinely believe in that we have turned a corner and we are an inflection point as a nation thank you thanks a lot for joining thank you thanks uh, to the minister for being a part of this session we now proceed to the panel discussion we have with us renana jhabwala mani sabarwal and abhi kapoor uh, i would request you all to stay connected with us on social media with the hashtag gender in india and also please share your questions to the panel in the zoom chat box uh, we'll try to take as many as possible um, i will first go to renana and uh, employment is the biggest question so how do we look at creating jobs at the bottom of the pyramid especially for women thank you for this introduction and for <clears throat> especially for uh, focusing on women and employment uh, which is a very important area that we need to really Uh, look at um <clears throat> i'd like to first say something about uh, your note said and you said actually uh, uh, talked about the low and declining labor force participation of women you know we rely only on the nss figures for this but um, uh, uh, my experience on the ground and also many of the studies Uh, including many micro studies have shown that actually the labor force participation is much much higher um but invisible to the enumerators and you know even invisible to the women themselves uh, i just give you one example of a micro study we did which was in bihar as part of a bihar task force with the government and uh, we got the study done on um, <clears throat> a sort of academic study using the nss definition because the nss showed only 11% of women were in the labor force now you know you go to bihar and every field has a woman working there when we did the same exactly the same questionnaire we found 56% and where were they not counted livestock working in their own farms all kinds of home based work where they produce things um so i think uh one really needs to look at where are the women working and i'm not even talking about care work and all that type of thing i'm talking about the nss definition of work um since they are not recognized they get no inputs no finance low productivity uh no markets so i think that recognition that there are many many more women working let's find them let's see where they are what needs to be done so that's the first thing uh i'd like to just add one thing to what the minister said about women and the economy or women during covid which is not only did they uh work try to get work 
to support the families, try to pivot their work. But also, uh, many of them became very active community leaders because nobody could go to the areas. So both digitally using WhatsApp groups and actual physically, they provided links to food, to cash, to, um, uh, to, uh, to employment, and of course, health. So I think this whole thing about women, you know, being inactive is not true. What all should we be doing? One of the things, of course, that we have been advocating is what we're calling a quasi-universal basic income, which was also advocated in the economic survey in 1617, um, which was just a small amount of cash monthly to women every month. And this smooths the income, gives them a safety net so that then they have something in hand when they go for work or even if they lose their work. So I think this is something we have been advocating for a long time. And if you now look at promises that are made, especially during elections and often also uh, kept, there is this thought of giving some small amount of cash to women. Um, now let me turn to some of the more practical things. Uh, this was, of course, practical, but some of the things that are going on. Um, Micro-entrepreneurship. Many, many of our women are actually micro-entrepreneurs. They're street vendors, weavers, food producers, stitchers, and I'm talking about non-agricultural right now. Um, but they are very, very small. So the annual turnover of more than 85% is less than 5 lakhs. Very, very small. Another interesting thing about them is that uh, where uh, enterprises are women-owned, 77% of the employees are women. So women do give opportunities of employment to women. And 20%, according to NSS, 20% of all micro-enterprises are women-owned. But in fact, uh, of the rest, women are very much part of them because they are family businesses. So at least 50% of the rest are actually uh, not necessarily owned in the formal sense by women, but women are very active in those businesses. What do we need to do? Uh, many businesses, some businesses have actually flourished during uh, COVID. Anything connected with food, and I'm again talking non-agricultural, anything connected with food, anything connected with health, anything connected <clears throat> with finance, you know, fi like um, uh, financial agents. So some have flourished. Some, and of course, many people who turn to making masks uh, have flourished. Many have actually suffered very badly, especially in the artisanal sector and in manufacturing of different types. I think what we need to do right now is, rec and of course, street vendors uh, who are not selling vegetables, the others, the vegetable vendors have done fairly well. We need to recognize, uh, reach out to these micro entrepreneurs. And the first thing they really need right now is some kind of capital because they've lost the capital. Um, so either, you know, a, a kind of small grant or which we can th think of as an investment or even otherwise they are willing to take loans, but we have no mechanism. And this is, I think, something that we really need to look at in the much longer term, a mechanism to reach finance to very small micro entrepreneurs, especially women. And I think that's a major, major area because we do have micro uh, credit, which reaches for consumption and very small loans. And then you have much larger, um, like in the banks, which reach much larger enterprises. So that whole system, that whole ecosystem is missing in our country. The other two things I would say, one is digital literacy is absolutely now necessary. A digital and financial literacy, especially since a lot of um, finance now has become digital. And finally, I would uh, ask the private sector 
to include them into their supply chains because markets have become very important. Sorry. Um, let me turn to agriculture. In 75 to 80% of women are in agriculture in some way or the other. Of these, 42% are cultivators. Again, that is underestimated because many women who work in their family farms don't get counted. Um, <clears throat> Unfortunately, only 16% of households actually have women who own land. So the land is owned by the men. Therefore, it is the men who are recognized as farmers. And it is the, though it may be the women who are working, um, the men, because agriculture is not well paying, men migrate, they go to other sectors. So more and more, there is a feminization of agriculture. But as women are not recognized as farmers, they don't get finance, they don't get subsidized seeds, they don't get subsidized fertilizers, and they don't get any extension services. I think this is a very major area where a lot of contribution can be made and will really change productivity, both of agriculture as well as of uh, many of these women. Um, another point I would like to make in microentrepreneurs and this combines with the issue um, of formalization that the minister talked about, which is that since they are so small, what we need to be doing and what SEVA has done for many years and found very successful is build social enterprises or collective enterprises like cooperatives or companies or um, <clears throat> farmer producer organizations. And those then formalize, they um, aggregate, and they move them up the supply chain, uh, which nothing else can do. Uh, finally, I would like to talk about uh, young girls. In the last 30 years, higher education has increased from 32% to nearly 50%. Um, and primary education now is over 90%. Uh, enrollment right now. On the other hand, uh, for formal labor force participation of women has really decreased. Um, many of these young girls do want to go for employment. And uh, again, from the study that I was quoting, and this is NSS data, uh, this was a study in Bihar, 55% of female youth who are uh, educated secondary and above say that they are unemployed. In other words, they're looking for work, but haven't found it. And this is a cohort that needs special attention. It needs bridging courses to go from education to work, needs uh, a very positive um, view from the employers who often are not hire hiring them. And I think it also needs some uh, motivation to the families because often families also don't send young girls for their work, or at least don't send them far. Um, finally, and just to wrap up, I mean, I've given a few ways in which women's employment uh, can increase, but more than increase, become more productive, become better paying, and give more visibility. Um, However, I do feel that unless women organize more, unless they themselves recognize their own worth as workers, which often they don't do, they talk about themselves as housewives and mothers, but the first identity is not that of a worker or a producer, though they may very well be one. So I think there is required some kind of organizing from, for young people, youth groups, for older women, different types of <clears throat> enterprises, social enterprises, or SEGs, or other ways in which they can come together. And not only recognize themselves as workers, but also project how they really are workers to the outside world. So I'll end there, and uh, any, happy to take any questions. You specifically pointed out the undercounting of uh, women workforce. Uh, it is not that low, but like in the end, you also pointed out that among the younger girls, you have seen a decline. So is it a, I, I'm trying to know, is it a problem of the system that you're pointing out towards or 
is it also about the nature of work uh, essentially women workers tend to do like you stated the example of farm work that they do right land is owned by men and but they do the work and then they don't can so it's not undercounting but it's the nature of work possibly which is uh, leading to those uh, outcomes of them being undercounted so how to address that specifically if you would want to say it's an undercounting the same man doing the same work will be counted the same a woman will not be counted i have seen this again and again so i'm sorry to say it's nothing but undercounting uh, and i'm talking not even talking about uh, work which is care work i'm talking about work which contributes to the economy in the way that it is defined uh, say in the nss or any other place so uh, it is an undercounting um, and there are many reasons for it Uh, because women do multiple occupations, because women themselves don't uh, come out and say I'm doing this work, because enumerators and I'm sorry to say this about NSS have become more and more badly trained um, because they're mostly contract labor now, uh, because uh, enumerators often don't have the patience to probe. So there are many reasons. Um, that this is happening, but it's an undercounting. Yes. Also, uh, the part you say of uh, community-led, uh, you know, uh, ASHA workers, self-help groups, everyone coming together for their upliftment. But we have seen that over the years, and of course, a lot of work is going on that front. But how can probably uh, in your organization also, how are you addressing it specifically? Especially, you know, because we are looking at the last two years specifically, the impact of COVID nineteen pandemic. So, how uh, can that be addressed at the grassroots level, especially for the marginalised women? You know, I actually agree with the minister that digital literacy, uh, connecting to the digital world, has become, and this is what COVID has shown us, has become extremely important. And uh, there is a very strong uh, gender gap in the digital world, um, and uh, especially at the base of the pyramid. I mean, just think of it. If there is a phone in the house, who will own it? Um, if there are two phones and one is a smartphone, who will own that? Always the man. So that digital gap, I think, really, really needs to be attended to. Uh, I mean, if I was to say, I'd say, give um, smartphones to women. Uh, if you want to give something free, and lots of things are given free, why not smartphones to women? So. Uh, and that would in itself just one action address a lot of the digital gap i pose my next question to manisha bawal uh, we are talking about undercounting of women i i saw you nodding on the low female labor force participation rate that you are saying for reason of undercounting but uh, the numbers are unfortunately those are the numbers which are being seen for policy making so what kind of uh, policy uh, devices could be used for recognizing them more and providing more social protection to women in the unorganized sector i mean first of all i'd be careful with presentism you know it's a disease which historians warn against you know covid hasn't created this problem it has just exposed a pre-existing condition so let's not um, you know blame covid we can blame it for many things but not for women's labor force participation um i do want to pause here before i you know my view is that a women ministry of women's employment is not different from a ministry of employment i i have spent a lot of time thinking about this and it it's hard for me to think about targeted issues i know avni has some thoughts and i I've, i've often talked about this with ranana but i do want to make five important points about progress you know when amartya sen wrote his article in 1991 about the millions of missing women the sex ratio was 9 27 um whether you believe 120 or 1020 or not it's definitely not at 927 second is one third of the it labor force is now women and 15% of india's pilots are women you know only 4% of america's pilots are women so there there are overseas of high um sort of penetration second college if you look at stock versus flow i mean flow if you look at law schools if you look at business schools and medical schools now women are almost in a majority there so that's going to be really good 5 10 years from now 
Second, I do think that this work from home, which, you know, for people like us, we were frustrated that it was living at work. But for many women, they've been used to living at work for a long time. And I, and I think work from home is a really important gift. You know, our estimate is that only 5% of the labor force worked from home pre-COVID. It will probably settle somewhere between 20 and 25. Um, we're not going back, everybody, to office. And I think that will create some opportunities. But the fifth, which is the most important one, is role models. You know, Maya Angelou says the universe isn't made of atoms, it's made of stories. And, you know, I've often looked, there were so many women in the independence struggle, but we can only think of Kamala Devi Chattopadhyay and Sarojini Naidu. And obviously these political deities and bahus and, you know, are not role models. But Indra Noe, Kiran Mazumdar, Kang are really important role models for the way we think. You know, as entrepreneurs, we the role models have really changed how we've thought about the future. So my view is that instead of thinking about glass ceilings, I think we should think about sticky doors. You know, one of my professors at Wharton, Minu Shafiq, she's written a great book about this, where... You know, the glass ceiling is getting broken, but there's still very sticky doors. And those sticky doors will really need you to formalize more. You know, 63 million enterprises only translate to 23,500 companies with more than 10 crores. So unless you change that ratio, it's going to be a problem. I think financializing India is really... Uh, Important, a credit to GDP ratio of 50% hurts everybody, but it hurts women disproportionately. So if we get to 100% credit to GDP ratio, I think that would be really useful. I do think that urbanization is better for women's labor force participation. You know, um, we can chat about, because I don't view self-employment as a solution. I, self-employment is mostly self-exploitation in the Indian context. So, you know, you don't pay yourself wages, you don't price your labor, and then you call yourself um, self-employed. So I would say that, you know, the decentralization, urbanization has many angles, but I think, you know, the central government budget is 39 lakh crores, 29 state governments have a budget of 84 lakh crores, but two and a half lakh municipalities and um, panchayats only have a budget of 3.7 lakh crores. And so I think the biggest thing that we need to do is decentralize power and money, because that is really going to be where the rubber meets the road. And finally, obviously, human capital. I mean, I think apprenticeships, skill universities, degree apprenticeships, you know, the, the notion of education and employability being separate have really um, been a toxic sort of, um, you know, if you think of Gandhiji's Nai Talim in his speech in 1934 at Varda, but none of that found its way into either either the 1948 Radha Krishnan report or the 1968 Kotari committee report or the 1986 um, education policy. So I think the new education policy, it has a 15 year glide path, which I think should be brought down to five years. But I think if NEP's glide path is dropped down to five years, that would also be another important sort of um, gift for women. So I'm not a big believer in fiscal policy. You know, if fiscal deficits could make countries rich, then no country would be poor. I'm not a big believer in monetary policy because, you know, I don't know whether that's a placebo or a painkiller or a steroid. But the structural reform of formalization, urbanization, industrialization, financialization and human capital is what we need to do. I'll come back to you, Manish. But uh, for one last question, probably to Renana, she has to leave, I think. Uh, he Manish mentioned about uh, how self-employment is possibly exploitation only, and you actually stressed on how self-employment or micro entrepreneurship is helping out women uh, uh, find employment, right? Uh, so, uh, where do we find the middle ground between these two? Because, uh, of course, this is the hard reality that women, uh, like you said, they will get they will not get counted while men will do. And that's how their nature of work also gets defined in the process, that it becomes more casual. They are a part of, like, they lost out uh, jobs in manufacturing sector, but uh, the services side, like he also cited some numbers, we see high female uh, workers out there. So is, isn't uh, self-employment very crucial for them then that way? Um, well, actually, I agree with Manish that, uh, <clears throat> and when I put it, when I said that they are very tiny and their annual uh, turnover is under five lakhs and um, they have a very small capital, 
uh, that uh, uh, what I didn't add is their productivity is also very small. The earnings are very small. Um, so it is, you know, the present day micro entrepreneurs are, uh, <clears throat> do, it's true they don't price their labor, or some do. I mean, some earn enough that their labor gets priced. They don't price it, but it gets priced. Um, my point, though, is that 50% of women who are working are um, micro-entrepreneurs. And uh, you're not going to tomorrow turn them into employees. And you're certainly not going to turn them in, into employees in the formal sector, which is not hiring many employees anyway. So what do you do? And what I'm suggesting is that you upgrade them. You recognize them. You increase their productivity through many different ways. So, um, <clears throat> so yes, many of the girls who are being uh, educated, can we get them into jobs? They, need, they want to go into jobs. Can we get them into jobs? And I think that's where Manish has done a lot of work. But um, for the majority who are self-employed, you, you know, you're not going to get them into jobs. You have to upgrade if you want them to live better. Right. Uh, coming back to you, Manish, uh, uh, of course, you mentioned uh, formalization is the way. But what about uh, transparency and equity in the pay structure for women workers? You know, one of my favorite economists is, at Harvard is a woman called Claudia Gold, and, and she's, written, she's written a great book in which she says that the difference can be explained by greedy jobs. <laughs> you know, greedy jobs are the ones which men do. I mean, they're, I'm not saying that this is an access problem, but I think the, 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 the pay gap in India in the formal sector is much lower than it is in Western countries for some reason. You know, in Western countries, you will see, and in my company or in many sectors in the formal, in the formal sector, which is obviously a tiny number in the broader scheme of labor things, I think that the, the Western economy started with a different opening balance. I think India's formal sector is starting with a different opening balance. Now, obviously, there's an apartheid between the formal and the informal sector in a, or, a, or a chasm which we have to cross, which I don't think is, I, in, you know, is by solving the problems of the informal sector. I think it's by formalizing them because it doesn't make sense. So I think that um, there are a number of forces which are reducing this pay gap. The biggest one is human capital. As I said, that on the flow of schools and colleges and law schools and business schools and medical schools, women are now much higher. So, um, I, so my sense is that um, we, we, it's a matter of time before the pay gap I think there are forces in motion which are reducing the pay gap in the formal sector, but women's labor force participation still needs the structural interventions we talked about. Coming to Avni, uh, who of course looks at the finance part of it, the public finance part of it, I want to know that public investments in the care economy, uh, they are a critical lever for economic recovery. And now that we have seen uh, COVID happening for last two years, uh, how do we support women's re-entry into the workforce through the budgeting part of it? How do public uh, policies focus on it and government budgets focus on it? Thanks, Anjal. And thank you for a uh, fascinating discussion so far. Um, so I think there are different ways of looking at it. And first of it is, first of, one way of looking at it is how do you boost some of the existing public investments? Um, and then second, areas that we need to start investing in a little bit more. Um, so starting with the first, um, at a time when government usually wants to cut expenditure, the sectors that seem to see the biggest hit are often the social sector, um, particularly health, nutrition, and even education, uh, which as Manish also said, is such an important, it plays such an important role for women. Um, this year, we saw the same, unfortunately, where the Ministry of Health, even in the year of the pandemic, saw only a 200 crore increase. Um, we have seen allocations for nutrition, which have been falling over a period of time. And even some of the previous priority schemes, like the LPG scheme, Ujwala, um, have seen a decrease in priority. And this is despite the fact that all the evidence suggests that public spending on 
whether it's infrastructure particularly things like rural transport child care education all are very strongly and positively correlated with increasing female labor force participation but more importantly just providing women the equal opportunity so i think one thing that we need to do is safeguard these schemes um, and especially in a time when social protection has been key um another way of looking at it is how do you ensure that you are investing in um schemes that provide some of, some of the enabling environment um so whether it is infrastructure support um or other ways of ensuring that women have access um and here i think that we've been doing um a decent job so schemes for example like the water scheme um a lot of analysis and reports i think a recent oxfam report for instance found that increasing households access to water um reduces the time women spend on collecting water uh, by 22 minutes and as a result of it it frees up their time for paid work um so i think it was a one hour increase and 22% uh, 22 minutes decrease so i think a detailed look at some of these schemes and I, and i am happy to say that this year as well we did see an increase in budgets for jal jeevan mission we've seen sanitation which is again a important scheme when it comes to providing women um time and as well as um for health benefits so we've seen some of the focus um on that which i think is definitely a positive way of looking at it but then of course there are areas that possibly we need to start looking at more um concertedly um and one of them is of course the big care economy so um so the promises that we had um, even this year in terms of inclusive growth as well as the need for a fast paced work economy one of the first steps um, is actually to undertake this identification of care workers um renana ben spoke about the measurement issues and um these are pervasive um, so one hand of course even the formal ones or rather those that are employed aren't um, really accounted for and then of course there are the unpaid un unpaid care workers as well that aren't included um so many people especially women um, are employed in the paid care uh, work sector um and what is interesting in some ways is that we are entering a demographic transition so as india becomes a more of an aging country the requirement of care work is going to increase which has potential for job creation um unfortunately currently the public expenditure on care economy is really low and i think that there is a need to significantly recognize it as well as enhance it another area and manish spoke about urbanization so i agree with manish completely i think another area is looking a lot at urban employment as well so during the pandemic we saw the kind of social safety net that narega played um in terms of providing employment opportunities and we know that even under um the mahatma gandhi national rural employment guarantee act um at least one third of nrgs workers are meant to be women um and you do see a lot of women actually accessing the scheme so there have been some states that have tried to talk about this urban employment and i think that um there is a need to think about an urban employment guarantee scheme a little bit more um even at the union level um which i think um hasn't yet happened um, I, but i think there are lessons that we can learn from some of the states that are doing doing this already um in terms of the way that we look at it from a budgetary lens um just coming i think one of the things that we've been doing for the past few years is coming up with a gender budget statement um and i think there is a need to relook at that um a lot of the way that the gender budget statement is done so while it's great that we have it and it's a way that we can actually track what's been happening and i can give these numbers the fact that the gender budget uh, as a pro the amount of money going reported in the gender budget as a percent of total expenditure actually declined um from 4.4% um, in 2021 to what they're projecting as 4.3% this year so it's great that i can quote these numbers because we have such a statement um but at the same time i think we need to relook at some of the way that 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 process is done um we've been working with a few state governments on this and it's often done unfortunately as a accounting exercise so you have schemes and you have schemes that um ideally are targeted towards women but actually in reality they don't actually reach the women um as much um so a lot of the um budgetary allocations for example in the gender budget statement is um based on the pradhan mantri awas yojana but yet i haven't seen enough studies to actually see whether how to what extent are women actually benefiting from this scheme um how has it changed their own um 
a livelihood as well um so i think something so relooking at that um could go a long way um of how do we report on it but more importantly how do we actually track it track it over a period of time um so these are just some ways in which i think we re- really do need to rethink um public expenditure for women um often our response um and again this is based on a study we were doing um looking um at some of the women centric schemes a lot of it is reactive um how do you react once a situation is gone um south but how do we make sure that we are thinking proactively and thinking a lot more about preventive measures so whether it is improving street lighting whether it is ensuring adequate transportation um how do we actually create a system that we are thinking about this um at every step of the way right uh, you spoke about how a rural employment guarantee uh, program provided safety net so of course that was one safety net the other safety net was mentioned by nana about quasi uh, basic income which uh, found a mention in survey some years ago uh, also uh, the whole uh, system of cash transfers you know that was one expectation which was uh, there since the beginning of the pandemic which didn't uh, happen that way uh, but uh, how much scope do you think that a cash transfer or a basic income uh, can help in such situations uh, to improve employment or safety net uh, for such workers who are probably uh, trying to find a space after a shock like covid i think i i do think that cash transfers are a great uh, short term um, exercise um i think unfortunately they are not often feasible um so we've seen P- the pm kisan was launched right which gives 6000 rupees to farmers bank accounts and as renana ben also said um unfortunately women lose out because they are not necessarily land owners um but what what happens with cash transfers is and i think what the pandemic did well was it was able to provide these short term uh transfers um so we did see um different state governments apart from what the union government announced in terms of providing some basic security net but then it does stop um i don't think that we know even for narega it is still continues to be underfunded even though there are a lot of allocations and a lot of money going for that scheme but we are still not being able to meet the demand that we have um similarly i think the other challenge is as i think the way to do it right um because targeting is always a big challenge and um again as renana ben spoke about measurements will always be a challenge so the way to do it right is to make it universal um and to do it um regularly and that's where i think the fiscal space will be hard um so i do think that those are great from a short term perspective but a little bit more medium and longer term i think we need to think about it far more structurally how do we ensure that we are creating enough job opportunities for women um i think the, again the during the covid pandemic we celebrated the ashas the aganwadi workers the anms the lady supervisors as covid warriors um uh, and just these people alone represent about 4 million people add to that the nurses the numbers are really staggering and i think some of the um analysis that has been undertaken is um i think by women budget group um, they did some analysis that showed even an additional 2% of the gdp that was in that is invested in the indian healthcare health and care sector could generate 11 million additional jobs many of which um, nearly one third of them would go to women um similarly again recognizing a lot of women's unpaid work would add to the gdp so how do you think of it um a little bit more structurally rather than just thinking of it as cash transfers i think cash transfers are great um during a pandemic but i do worry about a scheme will be launched and then suddenly the fiscal space will go and then um, again um no more cash transfers and the only way to do it well and do it right is to have a universal system rather than having a targeted system because we aren't able to do it well in terms of targeting in terms of labor statistics uh, there was a trend which we saw before the pandemic it was about uh, 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 women you know one of the reasons which was cited for low labor force participation rate and of course for the age group after uh, higher education there was a drop which was seen there and uh, a lot of people cited the 
reason to be uh, uh, women opting for higher education or probably uh, the male members of the family earning more and not requiring women workers to work that much that was also one of the uh, conclusions drawn upon by uh, that data that time by plfs data uh, the recent cmi numbers uh, in fact also show that unemployment rate has come down uh, in january but also shows that um, they are not looking for jobs so uh, where is that missing workforce um, uh, because um, i don't think we can ascribe the same reasons right now after the pandemic uh, if manish if you could answer on that i don't think india's problem is jobs i think it's a waste of time to talk about unemployment our problem is wages <laughs> i mean nobody knows what they're talking about when they talk about unemployment i mean unemployment has stayed between 4 and 9% since 1947 yeah. i mean and we it, our problem is employed poverty you know people have jobs they just don't have the wages that they need to live and flourish so what how do you fix that that's not some ayatollah issuing fatwas about minimum wages it is raising the productivity of our states of our firms and of our individuals you know i live in karnataka my parents live in up both states have the same gdp but we do it with one fourth the number of people i mean there's a 24 times difference in productivity between our biggest and smallest manufacturing firms and individually i give five times different salary to a kid with the same qualification on paper and the same age <laughs> so there's a if there's a five times difference in salary that reflects a five times difference in productivity so i would be careful with this microscopic precision and macroscopic confusion you know this this unemployment numbers are a poor weak and useless indicator for india's labor market challenges and particularly women's labor market right so then uh, coming to that part only how to improve the wage aspect of it of course uh, one part will get addressed by economic growth but uh, if we have to uh, address specifically about the gender parity you know, and uh, the wage aspect of it like you're saying to Form- formalize 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 urbanize industrialize financialize and human capital you know we we can there is no diet coke approach to this you know you want the taste without the calories there is no there is no shortcut to raising wages in an economy i wish there was i've thought hard about it we will have to m- the only way to help farmers is to have less farmers the only way to raise the productivity of firms is to formalize them because then they get access to credit they get access to talent they get access to technology you know finally it's it's really a complicated thing on how wages get set in a society india's you know it it wasn't god's will that it should take 72 years for 1.3 billion indians to cross the gdp of 66 million britishers it was because we chose a path of low productivity for our firms for our people and for our regions now hopefully we are changing that path we are far from complete with the reforms the regulatory cholesterol for msmes is very high the urbanization power has not devolved financialization so there is an unfinished agenda but i must say we have making good progress on the structural transformation there is some pain in the short run but i'm quite confident that um you know it employment is going from 5 million to 10 million you know 50% of india's fdi in the since 1991 came in the last 5 years we got 77 billion dollars of private equity so all this is just an indicator that maybe the world's capital you know is starting to think about india as a destination for 20 years it takes three things it takes land labor capital we don't have a shortage of land or labor and capital is being sorted out but the fourth factor of production which is entrepreneurship or innovation is held back by regulatory cholesterol and women's labor force participation and decent wages are massively held back by regulatory cholesterol so i think that's also an agenda uh, we have a question from uh, uh, marut nandan sharan of delhi school of social work um, uh, of course a lot of it has been answered but i would still take it what kinds of initiatives have been taken by the government to resolve the problem of job losses especially among women due to covid pandemic especially abhi you want to answer um so 
it's a difficult one in the sense that um there's a little bit of more of the same so um so in terms of job losses um what we've seen and as we started off luckily in some ways for women um in certain sectors whether it's health whether it's care um there was a lot of opportunity and there was growth there um i think that there are um a lot of it is done through loans um by providing some form of safeguards as well i don't think that there's been too much in terms of increasing women's ability to get jobs and then as manish would say jobs are not the problem and i completely agree with him there in the sense that i do think that we need to think a lot more seriously about um the wage gap um and i spoke about for example the anganwadi ashas and anms it is ridiculous that we have asha workers who are part of um, who are celebrated on one hand but at the same time they still don't have a salary um they are given incentives based on the work that they do um similarly we we know that there are minimum employ minimum wages um that are even as part of the nrgs but even those are not met and um, many of these minimum wages are um, appallingly low um so i think that there um this budget at least um focused le- less on the job creation directly but a little bit more on looking at capital expenditure um as a way to kind of push uh, supply side um measures so that we can hopefully have some form of trickle down effect um personally i do think that it was a little early um we are still reeling against some of the shocks of the pandemic um and as everyone has been saying um i think women apart from the suffering some of the job losses um i think that they did face a double whammy um because of school closures there was an additional child care responsibilities there was a need to take care of the elderly take care of sick family members um i am interested in trying to understand a little bit more of how the government is thinking about it um, especially in terms of education um, right now at least what um, digital was a lot of the focus um, and as renana ben also said it i do worry about digital i agree that digital is the future um, but i do worry about it because there are social um, factors at play um, many of which uh, renana ben also spoke about in terms of who has access to mobile phones where who has access to internet connections um so i think that 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 was a little surprising um, in this year's budget but but i think that in terms of the future um i think i agree with what most people said i think the focus needs to we do need to focus um, on ensuring digital and financial literacy we need to focus on ensuring that minimum wages are paid and in fact we go beyond minimum wages we make um jobs lucrative to women um and, and at the same time we also make it lucrative um for um the employment industry to to actually hire women as well um and apart from re- removing some of the disabling um barriers like i spoke about as well uh, we have another question from abha mishra from undp uh, and her question is do we just think of women or also lgbt group uh, what are the specific challenges faced by both the groups and how do you ensure no one is left behind Manish, would you like to take it? I I think that labor market outsiders, whether you're belonging to scheduled castes, whether you belong to scheduled tribes, whether you belong to rural areas, whether you're less educated, I think all labor market outsiders face the same challenges. And I and I and I'm not a big believer because of the scale of India in targeting. I think if SEZs are a good idea, make the whole of India an SEZ. You know, we have to fix this problem rather than put a bandaid on it. and the only way to fix this problem is to financialize urbanize industrialize <laughs> formalize and human capital i i mean it's there's just no shortcut to doing this i wish there was but um if anybody figures out you know public debt to gdp was 70% pre covid we'll come out of covid at 92% so even that is it, the space is lower you know we can get to 100 without having credit trading problems but beyond 100 it's a problem so i think when people say spend money then you have to be a little careful with you know the sustainability you know jonas sachs he was the inventor of the polio vaccine he said the most important question to ask yourself is are you being a good ancestor 
<laughs> and I think we were stupid economic ancestors. We were great political ancestors after independence. But for the last 50 years, we have not focused on productivity of firms and of individuals. And now if our firms can be more productive, all the wages we want for people will get paid. I mean, it's, it's, it, India doesn't have a shortage of land, labor, or capital. We have a shortage in how this combines to give well-paying jobs. Uh, is uh, just one small question from my side uh, because we discussed uh, women uh, workforce and COVID impact, but this uh, gap uh, impact of one you know one year gap impact of COVID pandemic. How to address that specifically? Of course, you you will again say formalize and just like but. <laughs> There's a very, uh, and this is not something, some trend which got worsened by the pandemic, right? So, but the uh, rebound has to be stronger. So, for quick recovery, is there a solution in your mind? Um, Avni? <laughs> I wish there was a quick band aid, but I do think that there isn't really. Um, like I said, you could do short-term measures like providing income transfers, which we did do. Um, but they are not sustainable. They are not feasible in the long run. Um, and I, like I said, anything that is targeted, uh, we struggle ta <laughs> finding the right person, um, in which case it, it kind of be, becomes unfruitful. Um, so I personally don't think there is a very, very quick fix. Um, but um, would love to hear Manisha's thoughts as well. No, I think RBI's balance sheet went from 34 lakh crores to 57 lakh crores in the last two, 24 months. Uh, government spending went from 24 lakh crores to 39 lakh crores at the central level. So I think that when the patient is in the ICU, you don't tell them to quit smoking or lose weight. You do triage. <laughs> I think this is a lot of triage. But we must be clear that COVID has not is an X-ray. It's just exposed the pre-existing fractures in our labor markets, in our in our delivery systems, and many things else. So I think that I wish there was a way to this two-year. I mean, COVID is no longer an event; it's an era, right? And we'll have the impact on learning. We'll have the we will only know the impact of this on kids after five years. We will only know the impact on incomes. But net net, I think you know, India doesn't change for a better option. She changes when you have no option, <laughs> and I think. COVID is creating the conditions in public finance and state government finances. You know, state government finances depend on alcohol, stamp duty and uh, petrol. And they are all bankrupt. So I think they will also make the choices now that hopefully will structurally transform and put us on a path to higher productivity. I think that is really the only real solution. We need more productive people, we need more productive firms, and we need more productive regions. Um, so COVID is a hearing aid in some sense, um, and I think that it's, it, it is going to force change. It has brought digitization forward by 10 years. It has brought working from home and flexibility forward by 10 years. But hopefully it will also bring um, some of the productivity, um, difficult productivity measures, which cause short-term pain for long-term gain forward by 10 years. Uh, we spoke of uh, digitization and you uh, mentioned just right now also, we spoke of it for future also, more digitization and more financial literacy tools. But uh, especially uh, with the recent phase, have you seen this uh, creating some positive impact on female labor force participation, the hybrid work mechanism uh, and digitization? Has this helped boost uh, the female labor force participation? Lovely. I think this question is for you. You're, I think you are far more experienced when it comes to employability and employment. <laughs> No, I think that it's still early to say because um, originally, see, the cognitive elite can work with at home. You know, people who work with their hands and legs can't work at home. So originally it has created a bit of a, um, the working from home has created a divide in the labor force between people who can work from home. and But I think the digital tools will genuinely shift 5% of the people who used to work from home from 20 to 25 and it will also shift it from, you know, you have to be in Bombay to work in Bombay. 
I, but I think it's too early to say whether it will be flexibility, right? We are all struggling with, should everybody be allowed the same day off? <laughs> I mean, if you're only going to come into office or does every because the coordination costs are too high. So there's a little bit of learning that has to happen for employers and employees to negotiate getting the benefits of this new flexibility. But I do think that this digitization will allow a number of women who either for the commute time or for the um, living in a city where, you know, real wages and nominal wages just had a huge divergence and it wasn't worth living there. And this will be applied to, to everybody. So I think, yes, I think digitization will help labor market outside. To bring in the micro rural perspective, I think one of the positives that we saw during the pandemic um, was how, again, I'm, I work a lot in the social sector. So a lot of my examples, I apologize, are from the social sector. Um, so just the way that things were, you were able to mobilize even information, education, and communication campaigns in a really fast manner using WhatsApp. Um, so we were visiting um, and speaking to different um, Anganwadi workers, um, Asha workers, and as as we celebrated them as COVID warriors, how do we, we how were, were we able to bring out information regarding social distancing, regarding um, patient care in, in across such a large country? And a lot of it was through digital tools. Um, so it was fascinating that trainings that used to be very much offline in a physical way, which took a lot of time, which um, included travel and how do you negotiate losing your wages in order to actually travel for a training. Um, these were done through short videos, through conversations on WhatsApp. Um, and I think that WhatsApp was revolutionary in that sense when it came to actually being able to communicate very, very sensitive topics, but um, to a large number of people in a very short time. And um, I was very impressed that we, we did a survey where we tried to understand whether people felt that training was adequate because our assumption was that can you really train properly on online in an online world? We struggle sometimes um, paying attention. Um, and most people actually were quite comfortable with it. Um, so I think that's also going to be um, revolutionary in terms of um, how, how can you train and um, possibly even skill a large number of people in a short time um, through digital mediums. And just access, you know, I was born and brought up in Kashmir and I can guarantee and I know now because we already have 4,000 employees there that a number of people who were not willing to move out of the state and a large part of them were, were women are now working in jobs in the formal sector from, from Srinagar or wherever they are. So I think that um, this is still early because there's learning to be done. You know, there's institutional learning to be done both by employers and by employees. But I don't think you can put this toothpaste back in the tube. So digitization is, is really an ally in our um, war to sort of raise labor force participation for women and for all labor market outsiders. The next question, as an assigned Manisha, I'm also Kashmiri. <laughs> okay. Oh, excellent. So um, uh, specifically coming to incentives to investors for supporting women-led and women-driven companies, startups, since you mentioned a lot about formalization, uh, how to invest in and engage with women-owned businesses and corporate supply chains? I mean, I think there is a revolution going on in India's startup um, world I, I you know my parents were civil servants and the gift of a civil service upbringing is that you realize early in life that you don't live in an economy you live in a society but one of the most difficult things was convincing them about the financial risks of entrepreneurship because in the india of our parents you had to have your own money or you had to have a surname or you had to have connections to be an entrepreneur and be successful i think that the change in the side of supply side the money which $77 billion, the one unicorn born every 10 days, nine out of 10 of these people will fail. You know, it, I had a wonderful course at my business at Wharton called Stupid Entrepreneurs and Wise Society because society needs everybody to overestimate their odds of success. But I think the kind of role models of women entrepreneurs coming out, if you look at the startup um, founding, obviously that it, it is not where it, it is not reflective. And that is really because 
engineering colleges are still one of the last bastions of <laughs> where women's labor force and enro- women's enrollment has not gone up now either they either they're smart because they think engineers are stupid and you know life is not the solving of a sum it is the painting of a picture but i would say that given the the low teens women's um enrollment in engineering colleges and the majority in law school really shows up in some startup founders but it's yesterday's nascom report is an important indicator that if one third of the 5 million people in technology are women which means that the f- stock is still a problem but the flow is really changing and i think all of us need to focus on flow because stock is depressing <laughs> but flow is really really exciting i think that in all ways i in 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 technology obviously i mentioned pilots uh, you can see it in lawyers so what i would submit is that um the startup found one third of these people of the 5 million who are working in software the biggest source of startup founders is alumni of software services <laughs> so these one third of the women will become the founders of tomorrow and especially now that we have some wonderful role models in technology too i mean so so i would i am a big believer and you know i grew up in i i grew up professionally in bangalore and so our role models are nandan and you know kiran and azim premji and all these people and so we built our companies differently you know my parents live in kanpur now after retiring their role model is Ponty Chadda or Subroto Rai Sahara or you know something else. Trivedi who built their companies on regulatory arbitrage, right? So I would say that this role modeling of successful women entrepreneurs is much more important than the money which is coming in. So so there is a lag. I know we're all um, a little wish it could move faster, but I am quite um, from the founders. proposals and the flow that i see among our clients and among investing i think that if you monitor flow you'll start getting to the one third um it employment among founders too uh, last two questions from the audience uh, what steps are being taken to employ tribal women uh, it has been asked by balmiki patra who works in social sector unfortunately okay. the the tribal um, plans within government um, tend to be underutilized completely um, so while we do have policies in place where we are meant to ring fence money and send it to areas that have a larger tribal population um, i don't think that we've thought about it enough um, and we've seen that again it comes back to targeting right so we've seen that targeting tends to be not very accurate um, there are proportions and formulas that are in place saying that different ministries have to allocate a certain amount of money for tribal programs um, and i'm going i'm not even reaching the women side of it this is just even targeting towards uh, tribal programs um, and and even that i think um, we haven't really done enough um, there um, there have been multiple uh, reports um, every committee i think talks about the fact that um, while Uh, we have recognized the need to actually focus on uh, both tribal and scheduled caste um, plans but at the same time we've we've seen that it hasn't happened in the same way um it's really hard to actually track whether the money is being used on the right things is the money actually um, reaching the right people um so i think that there's a long way to go um when it comes to tribal women um i don't again i think just just because we've not been able to even reach the first step i don't think that we have um i think um we we've, we've not actually done enough to focus on tribal women i think that there is a need to actually understand um a little bit more on their specific requirements um and actually design policies for it i agree with manish that i think that it's a always a balancing act that we need to make um sometimes i worry about very very specific policies to addressing a particular section of society um and that kind of almost re re emphasizes the differences that exist but at the same time um, there are certain needs that need to be met and i think that um, how do you actually design policies in a way that have either a gender lens or actually have um, a lens of looking at the specific on ground needs of of different um um groups and actually targeting policies around that uh, most of the policies that we've seen are things like scholarship programs that are that are for 
tribal women um, again education is such a big thing um, i think that 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 has done positively and a lot of the schemes tend to be dbt schemes so that's actual income into a bank accounts when it comes to scholarships but i do think a lot more can be done uh, last question is from uh, uh, srishti arora a social impact consultant where do we see maximum workforce coming in and being absorbed uh, manish would you like to you know i i think it's a fool that and to try and predict where jobs will be you know i have studied every global report us in 1980 japan in 2000 uk in 2010 and all of them have the efficacy of palm reading or astrology i mean it's just absolutely impossible to predict where jobs will be in the long run but just because we can't predict doesn't mean we can't prepare for it right so we can become make our economy more self healing we can start introducing apprenticeship programs which makes skilling demand driven we can start thinking about primary education you know because i can i can't teach people in 3 months or 3 years what they should have learned in 12 years you know so repair and prepare are really difficult so i think that you know obviously domestic consumption is going to be a big source of demand the fastest growing segments of india's labor market are sales customer service and logistics obviously it employment is going from 5 million to 10 million obviously manufacturing is going from 11% of the labor force to 15% i don't think we'll ever get to china's 23 and uk's 48 but um we will be growing in all areas so i think that this year maybe services exports i mean india will export more software this year than saudi arabia will oil now you have to process the implications of that complexity of 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 doing that so my sense is let's not try and predict where the jobs are let's just fix the structural challenges of india and trust our big and small entrepreneurs and financiers i mean the role of the government is not to set things on fire it is to create the conditions for spontaneous combustion okay but thanks uh, i will pass on to now dr sona mitra principal economist i wait for the concluding remarks thank you achal and thanks to the speakers thanks to this excellent discussion um at i wish we continue to work on these several issues the issues that have been highlighted actually you know the issues around women's labor force participation is central to all the questions that we try to work on currently uh, working on several studies um, at looking at the reasons behind the reduced labor force participation or low labor force participation of women and a lot of it a uh, lot of the things that were said today by the speakers as well as the minister uh, actually have a lot of um, um, importance for us and things that we already know things that we already want to uh, work on and of course some insights that came out in the discussions with uh, especially between the panelists uh, they were very good in terms of uh, taking forward the um, kind of work that we do the areas that we look at are several the them- thematic areas but the approaches that we follow is basically to understand the quality of work of women the barriers that we, that they face in terms of entering the labor force and also what is the power of economic collectives of women that is to understand the power of uh, self help groups and uh, how much uh, potential entrepreneurship has for women so all of these questions and all these areas were touched upon but it was very encouraging to hear from the minister himself that they are looking at skilling women in different ways which is something that has been talked about for a very long time and um, uh, uh, it was it, it, it is at least uh, I, i don't know how it would be implemented on the ground we are yet to see but it was really really encouraging to understand uh, or to 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 have a uh, to get to know that the government is understanding the need for diversifying the occupational patterns of women and um, looking into aspirations that are out of the traditional roles and livelihoods that women have been following for so long so yes thanks so much to indian express for this joint um, session that we had today and we are also gearing up for a few more so looking forward to some more discussions of the sort and thanks to everybody thanks for my wish thank you sona uh, we'd like to thank our presenting partner iwage for helping us put the series together um,
Many thanks to everyone who joined us today. Uh, we'll be in touch with you as we announce the next event that focuses on specific aspects of gender uh, in order to get a deeper understanding of the challenges that lie ahead and to uh, find direction. Uh, good night.